This story happened around four years ago, back when I was 18 and had just graduated high school. I decided to volunteer for a month in a southern Asian country before my university starts since volunteering was something I always wanted to do. I managed to find a place to volunteer at and was supposed to live for the first week with family friends, then I'd start living at my workplace. Thing is, my workplace couldn't house me due to construction and having another female volunteer coming soon, so I had to find a hostel to stay at, and that was probably my biggest mistake. I went on the internet and started looking for a hostel. Sure enough, I found one in the center of the city in a relatively safe area. Also, the hostel had many great reviews from foreigners, so I thought it was safe. I visited the hostel and was greeted by Jin. He was the nephew of the owner and was responsible for greeting foreigners and showing them around. Jin was in his mid-twenties, an average-looking dude, probably around 5 foot 8. I'm 6 foot 3, which will be important later. After I make the arrangements for my stay there and agree to come the next day, he invites me to go with him on a walk to show me around the neighborhood which I agree to. During our walk he tells me about himself. He lived in the UK for a bit, tells me about his family and asks me if I smoke. Back then I was a cool kid fresh out of high school, so I ecstatically told him yes since I was actually trying to get some bud but didn't know how. He told me he can get it for me and when I come tomorrow, he'll have some for me. The next day I go to the hostel and he tells me that he couldn't get it so I have to go with him to his friend's, George's, to get it and in hindsight, that was a big red flag but I was a dumb kid who really wanted to smoke so of course I said yes. George almost looked like a cartoon villain. All his facial features were sharp and narrow and he had the little Van Dyke beard to go with it. We all get into the tuk-tuk and drove to the slums of the city to meet the dealer. I think the area was called Wanathamula, not sure. Anyways, we get the bud and they tell me we are making a stop at George's house and smoking there for a bit. Fine by me. I had no reason to suspect them since they were nice and polite to me. We reach his house, still within the slums area. It was a small room with a bed and three chairs, nothing else. No tables or decor or anything. I sat on a chair. Jin sat on my right and George sat on the bed rolling out some joints for us. We start smoking and talking. They started asking me about why I'm here, how old I am and stuff like that. Suddenly it started becoming a little too personal. Asking me what my parents do for a living, how much they make. And the one that really caught my attention. Who are the people you live with? The family friends. And do they know where you are and are they going to worry about you if you don't call home soon or something to that effect? I was stoned by then, but the moment they said that I started sobering up quick and realizing that I'm in a messed up situation. I told them that I'm supposed to call in a few hours and that they knew which hostel I'm staying at. Suddenly another guy came and just stood at the doorway completely blocking it. He was about my height but much bigger in size than me. I was trapped between them and essentially had nowhere to go. Luckily they couldn't do anything to me yet since I told them I'm supposed to make a phone call to my family friends. Starting to get very nervous and anxious, I tell them I'm too baked and can't even move or smoke so kept passing up on my turn to smoke. I just lay there acting as if though I'm high out of my mind. They started speaking in their native language and it was clear to me that they were actually talking about me. Jin told them about all my electronics I had and that I had paid my full stay in cash. Now George, God bless his soul, thought I wasn't aware of my surroundings, so in perfect English, Jin told me he doesn't speak English, he started mocking me, kept saying nice phone and asking me if I know how to swim. I just looked at him and smiled and told them it's time to go because I was starting to get tired. We walked out and I told them I needed to go to the market real fast and if they needed anything, and they kept telling me that they'll get me whatever I wanted themselves, but I insisted that I wanted to go and that they should send one of them with me, and they sent the big guy. Now the market was across the street from a bus station and the buses don't stop at the station. They just slow down and you hop in and hop out, so now was my chance. I waited until I saw the bus approaching sprinted like my life depended on it, and it did. 
and hopped in. They were screaming at me to come back and started running after the bus. And at one point I even heard one of them scream that you're lucky. The moment the bus reached the neighborhood of the family friends, I hopped out and walked around the neighborhood until morning came. In the morning, I went to work and told them that a tuk-tuk had tried to kidnap me. So, they escorted me to the hostel where I took my belongings and work allowed me to stay with them, thank God. When I told my family friends about what happened, they told me it's a common scam here and that they were planning to steal my belongings and dump me in the river when they left the house. And that's why they asked if I knew how to swim and if someone was expecting me. This happened a long time ago when I was about 4 to 5 and I'm 15 now. Looking back at the situation I really think I should have seen the red flags about this guy. But since I was really young and stupid I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I just thought he was a kind guy. The whole thing happened in the mall, in plain sight in front of hundreds of people. I had gone with my mother shopping, girls day out, you get the gist. At some point I get lost in the mall. Typical. Everyone has a story like that, right, as a kid? And so far, no red flags at all. I remember seeing a guy with a very southeastern accent. He was dressed like a junkie, but in my five-year-old mind, I thought he looked fine. So since I was a lost five-year-old girl who didn't know any better, I walked up to him and asked him for directions, if he had seen my mother, etc. He ignored my questions, and when he saw me, his eyes lit up. He immediately started showering me with compliments. Some of them were even inappropriate to say to a five-year-old child. He gave me a pink and black bracelet and told me how well it looked on me. Of course, I was oblivious to the situation and ignoring all the red flags. So at some point, he offers to take me to his fake private jet and fly me to an exotic island to relax and play with the dolphins. Basically made it sound like some type of child's paradise. All I had to do was get in his car. Of course, since it sounded like a dream come true, I trusted him and almost got in his car. I kid you not, at the exact moment I was about to leave the mall, some dude with a uniform stopped him dead in his tracks and asked him where he was going with a five-year-old girl. I guess he could easily tell that we weren't related, especially the way the guy was dressed. The guy responded with his raspy southeastern accent. This is just my daughter's kid. I'm taking her home. We were clearly not related, and so the uniform guy asked me where my mother was. I told him she was still in the mall, and from that point on, there was some arguing between the two gentlemen. I didn't get the most of it, but I ended up with the well-dressed guy, and the junkie cursed him out, walking away. We went to the lobby of the mall and found my mother there, telling the worker behind the desk my description. She had clearly picked up by this point that I was gone. It turned out the guy in the uniform was a security guard at the mall and had picked up on how wrong the situation seemed to him, a good intuition. When my mom saw me with this guy, she picked me up and hugged me as tight as she ever had. I'm a female college student and I live with my family in an apartment in a big city. Where I come from, it's pretty normal to just go to the college near your house. This happened on a weekend when my family and I had planned a trip abroad, but last minute I had an exam rescheduled for that Monday, so I decided not to go. So it's Thursday and my parents and siblings are leaving for the airport, and the guy that they usually hire is taking them to the airport. My mom tells me that, my maid is staying with me for the weekend and then I should call her if I need anything. I say goodbye and go back to studying. So it's now Thursday at around 9pm and I'm studying in the living room with my boyfriend so the maid actually tells me it's getting late and she's going to bed so I tell her that I'm going to bed soon too. An hour later, my boyfriend leaves. It's now around 10.30pm and I'm getting ready for bed. I grab my dog, a small Yorkie, and take her to my room to sleep with me. So it's about 11pm and I'm in bed looking at my notes when my dog starts growling at the door. But I tell her to shut up because Yorkies are very nervous and bark all the time, at least mine does. So after she's silent, 
I get this adrenaline rush and stay very still, and I hear steps in the corridor. The floor is made of wood, so when I heard specific creaks, the sound of wood bending, I know the steps are getting near my room. So at first, I think it's probably the maid making sure my boyfriend didn't stay over. But when the footprints stopped at my door, I started to freak out. I was even compelled to say the maid's name, that he's not here, you can come in and check. But somehow I knew it wasn't her. So I call my boyfriend and tell him someone was in my house. He tells me to put on some shoes and check the other rooms. I really don't want to, but I'm not going to be able to sleep until I'm sure there's absolutely nobody. I find some courage and put on some shoes and start walking very slowly towards my sister's room, checking with my phone light to see if it's empty. The bathroom is empty, my parents' room is empty. By this time, I'm getting more relaxed because I think I must have just imagined it. Then I go to my parents' bathroom and it's also empty. I walk to their room closet and scan the room with my phone light when I shed light on a human figure. It was obviously not my maid, but I say her name and a tall muscular body answers, no, and says the name of the driver that took my parents to the airport. I freeze and try to act cool, but he invents some petty excuse that he was just checking that the windows were closed. I tell him it's late and he quickly leaves the house and I called my parents to verify his excuse. He was obviously lying and then he has the audacity to ask me via WhatsApp if I want him to drive me to college tomorrow. Thankfully, my parents had a very stern talking with him, and I never saw him again. I'm just curious what his true intentions were. This happened last fall. A friend of mine and myself went on a hike one day at a national park. We live by it so we hike the trails a lot and know the land pretty well so we adventure off the trails quite a bit. On this day it was kind of chilly, good to know for the story I suppose, but we went on a trail that starts at the end of the park and circles back to the parking lot. But we have a spot we like to chill at that's about halfway down the trail and to get there you have to cross the river and continue walking down the river for a little while. There's only one spot that's good for crossing where the water is only about knee high. Everywhere else you pretty much have to swim. Well, on our way to our spot, still on the main trail, we pass this man that's walking back towards the park. I immediately got weird vibes right off the bat. I'm a friendly person and I don't just ignore people when they walk past me on trails. I just say hi and comment on the beautiful day and whatnot. This man straight up stopped walking and was just trying to make a conversation, but his eyes kept looking me and my friend up and down and it was just an incredibly uncomfortable atmosphere. I pretty much told him we better keep moving on because we had things to do after our hike and needed to get it done. Just so he'd get the idea, we couldn't stand there talking to him. We get to the spot to cross and continue our adventure to our hangout spot. We're just sitting there smoking and relaxing, then I see some movement down the river on the other side. It's the same guy, and he looks like he's looking for us. I was sure of it. Now my friend is wearing some neon colored clothes, so he spots us right away. He then starts to cross the river, and the deep side too. It's freezing cold, and there would be no reason for him to cross other than to try to get to us. I told my friend to pack their stuff and let's haul it out of there. I'd never had a feeling like I had that day like we were in danger and that action needed to be done immediately. I found this rock while I was getting our stuff to put in the bag. It was about the size of a softball. One end was blunt and rough where I could get a good grip on it. The sides came down to a point, but not to a point. I guess the best way to describe it would be a tool that you would use to take the hide off an animal. Anyways, I was full and ready to do whatever I needed to do to save her and myself and that rock would do some serious damage if not kill this dude. I'm so happy it didn't come to that. But as we're breaking out of there, I look back and see the guy struggling in the higher water as he's crossing. It even seemed like he had been yelling something as the water came up to his face, and 
He was struggling and attempting to wave us down to divert our attention to him. I wasn't sure if this was to lure us to him as if though he needed help, but I wasn't following for it. We lost him because we cut through the woods and ran as hard as we could to the conservation building up on the hill. We found some other men and told them about the man at the river, and they gave us a ride back to the parking lot and waited there until we left. I don't know if they found that weird dude or what, but it was honestly one of the strangest and truly scariest moments of my life. This happened about five years ago when I was 13. I had just moved to Texas and I was having a blast meeting all of my cousins, aunts, and uncles. At first everything was fine, but slowly I realized that my family had a lot of dark secrets they would rather keep hidden. Some of these secrets were actually two of my cousins. The point is that they were trying to hide my cousins as much as possible, but since they were tornadoes in human form, it didn't really work. I ignored it as best I could. I had my own problems and nothing was going great, so I decided it was not worth it. Then I was introduced to my little cousin, Alan. Alan was only three when I met him, and honestly he was so sweet, albeit chaotic and messy. I saw him as my little brother, mostly because my relationship with my actual brother was horrible at the time. I babysat him constantly and I had no idea the storm that was about to come. His dad was my cousin and he smoked a lot and that I had always known. But after Christmas of that year I noticed a severe lack of seeing him. I went from seeing him every week to seeing him once a month if I saw him at all. Only when Alan's foot got slashed with broken glass did I realize what was going on. They were neglecting him, and my heart broke. I did as best I could to take care of him from then on. Going to the park, feeding him sweets, playing with him all the time, etc. Then my cousin stopped letting me see him. It didn't hurt as much as I thought. I had seen this coming. Then to my absolute shock, I found out my cousin and his wife, Alex and Maria, had been dabbling in hard drugs. I noticed of course how sunken their faces were but I just assumed that they weren't eating because they never could hold a job. I was 14 when I found this out and saying I was angry doesn't describe it. The closing instant for me was when Alex and Maria went to Alex's mother's home, my aunt, and demanded they be let inside. She allowed them, for the baby of course, and they fought all day every day for days on end. After two weeks, my aunt subsequently threw them out, and I was there when she did. She left to work without another word to them, and my mom forced me to give Alan back to his dad. I didn't want to, and I almost cried as I held his little hand down the stairs, almost all of my family watching. The moment Alan realized what I was doing, he began to cry, clinging to me like he had never had before. His father scooped him up and smacked him telling him to shut up. And that was it for me. I went up to Alex and asked him to give me the baby. I'm pretty sure I gave him some excuse, something like he needed his bottle or something, but he refused. I asked him again, and that was about the time my mom realized what I was doing. And for the first time in my early life, she let me do what I did best, start a fight. He started to get violent, then Maria showed up and they started to fight. I was getting sick of this and the noise was starting to get into my head, so I asked very loudly if I could just have Alan. Suddenly both of them were extremely mad at me, screaming and cussing at me. My aunt and mom got very defensive but they never came down. I tried my best to keep calm and asked for the kid one last time. Maria even swung at me, missing but almost catching me in the jaw. I punched her in the stomach once and knocked her off her feet as fast as I could. She was sick, so beating her up was easy. Alex was a different story. Despite being more weak and fragile, he still hit me with a lot more strength than I thought he could muster, and I stumbled around for a while before hitting him clean in the jaw. I grabbed the kid and ran up the stairs, giving him to my mom, who was luckily recording this whole incident. I ran back down just in case, but they were done for by the time they hit the floor and we had all the evidence that we needed to show to the police and the legal proceedings that followed. And my aunt won the case. 
He's eight now, Alan, and he asks about this chaotic time of his life all the time, but no one will tell him, including myself. I just won't. Maybe I'll wait till he's older. I just don't want him to remember who his parents used to be. When I was 17, I hung out with some less than well-behaved people. Druggies, thieves, dropouts, etc. Although I kept sketchy company, I was always a good person. So when it came to my friend needing help moving, I was there and ready. My friend's mother had to work, so he asked me as well as a few others to help unload the truck. After we got everything unloaded, we all decided to go smoke a bowl of the green goods in the basement. While we were smoking, though, nature called. I had to go number two. Luckily, the basement door led right into the bathroom, right? Well, while I was on the pot in the middle of my business, I heard movement in the living room. I thought it was strange, but mostly ignored it. Then, suddenly the bathroom door began opening. Sitting there, ready to make a joke out of someone walking in on me, I casually waited for the person to show themselves. Except when they did. It was a police officer. At this point, I don't know who was more surprised. The cop who was apparently responding to a home invasion call, or me. The guy on the pot, while his friends were just finishing up smoking the pot right on the other side of the door from us. It must have been this police officer's first week on the job because the first thing he decides to do when he sees a young man with his pants around his ankles is pull his gun. The look of fear on his face, his shaking hands, brow and sweat. I could see he was truly more scared than me. I had to talk this police officer down from pulling that trigger on me. He was breathing heavily with fear. No, and I am not being dramatic. I had to calm and negotiate my way out of being shot for pooping in my friend's house. Luckily, he let me explain the situation to him and call my friend up from the basement to explain what was going on and why we were there. Luckily, the three cops that were there after hearing that we were not home invaders left feeling incredibly embarrassed to even notice that we were all high. Looking back on this from an adult perspective, I'm just thankful I'm around to tell it, because even though my story is the sort of thing you see in comedies, it could have turned out much worse for me. After receiving my bachelor's degree, I wanted to take some time to see the world before settling down in a career. I ended up taking a job as an English teacher in South Korea. I loved the adventure of being alone in an entirely different culture on the other side of the world. However, as a young, blonde, white woman, I received a lot of unwanted attention from the men there, who tended to fetishize foreign women and disrespect boundaries. However, I was strong, trained in martial arts, and was pretty comfortable in my ability to defend myself, so I didn't let it get to me. One night, however, I had a close call. I was heading home from work after dark, walking the several blocks home to my apartment. This night, however, something was different. I soon became aware of footsteps behind me that followed me the entire way. It could just be a coincidence, I thought. There were always a lot of people on the sidewalks anyways, but this one just fell off. I made it to my apartment, which was on the third floor of a small building above a Chinese restaurant. There were only about nine apartments total in the building, so the fact that the footsteps continued to follow me as I entered the building and climbed the stairs made it less likely that this was a coincidence. Whatever, I thought. If this idiot wants trouble, he's gonna find it. I continued up to my apartment, unlocked it, and went in. I didn't bother locking it because, as I always did... I was only coming in to change into my tennis shoes and get my dog to take her out for a walk. My dog was a rather large Alaskan Malamute. Like me, she stood out like a sore thumb in this city because most everyone else only owned cute little toy breeds, usually Pekingese and Shih Tzus with their fur dyed bright colors. When I walked my Malamute, people often let out a scream and ran to the other side of the street. But either way, upon entering my apartment, I removed my work shoes, got my dog, and went back to the door to put on my sneakers. As I bent down to pull them on, I leaned against the door for balance and fell through, as the man who had been following me was opening it. 
not expecting me to stumble out with a monstrous dog. The man looked shocked and frightened. He grabbed his keys out of his pocket, went over to my neighbor's door and pretended to be fumbling with them to open it. I gave him a look as if to say, yeah right, locked my door and took my dog down the steps outside. Once I made it outside I crossed the street and hid behind a car. Sure enough, within seconds, the man, supposedly my neighbor, emerged from the building, looked around for a while, and then bolted. He had clearly spotted me walking home and saw his opportunity to follow me and break in and attack. Had I not leaned against the door at that moment, he would have burst in and attempted to proceed with his plans. This incident shook me, but I never let it, or the others before or since then, stop me from doing what I want to do or go where I please. I just go prepared, ready to take action the next time a man makes a bad decision. To say the least, moving to a different college for the third time wasn't the best decision for my life. Unfortunately, I hadn't had any luck with any of the other colleges. I just decided that this school would be a better pick because it was far away from family drama and that would be a great way to start over. I was very wrong. Moving up there made me realize how lonely I was. I was desperate to look for a guy because I couldn't make friends due to COVID. Finally, and my life would change in October of 2020. I made the decision to meet up with a 30-year-old guy. Should have been the first red flag, but being the lonely 23-year-old girl that couldn't make friends, I didn't care. To say the least, the date went great. Too good to be true if I say so. But I had a really bad gut feeling at one point when I came to hug him. It was dreadful. Of course, the gut feeling was ignored. And later that night... Us being really high and drunk, he finally confessed that he had an ex that had died due to an overdose and a head trauma. Come to think about it, I don't know for sure if that was the case. Time went by, and things were starting to turn pretty bad with him. He was constantly always talking about other girls, and how when he was with them, he had intimate videos of every girl he's been with. He was also moving out of his place, and me being the nice person... I helped him move out and move into his new place. I started to see his true colors though, yet I didn't leave. He forced me to like girls and let's just say it's explicit for what he did to me. The last few months of that relationship were just pure torture and a way for me to find an escape. There was a point where if I didn't talk to him in a sweet tone, it triggered him to pin me down and beat me with his knees. My face became unrecognizable. He then proceeded to pull out his rifle and his small gun different times and pointed it to his head, then at me, saying that he would kill both of us if the police would come. He would make death threats if I were to call the cops and get him arrested. I tried running away, but I was only about five foot and him being six foot three I didn't get anywhere. I was trapped, and to make things worse it was now snowing in Texas and nobody was allowed to leave. I had to hide my face with makeup and he had to make sure it was on right before seeing his family. During the whole time, it ends up that I was always in the wrong for having guy friends while he still had dating apps and was talking to other girls so we can have additional members to our relationship. Now, I'm not hating towards relationships that have more than two people but that's just not my thing. He just kept gaslighting me into believing he wanted to marry me and that he only wanted me. In addition to these lies, he had me on drugs to get me addicted and have other reasons to stay. Now, the end of the relationship was definitely a crazy story. I was forced to meet his 11-year-old daughter. Of course, he told me about her on the first date, but at the time, I was sick and honestly, I wanted to feel better before meeting her. I was forced to meet her. I drove 45 minutes with a fever to finally meet his daughter. But what she told me when he would walk out of the room is something I'll never forget. She just released hate towards her dad. She was convinced that he killed his ex and proceeded to tell me how abusive he is. I feel guilty about telling her the partial truth about what he has done. He started getting aggressive every time his daughter would leave the room and he'd blame me for her distancing herself. 
I would tell her about it and I'm so thankful that she was on my side, and to my surprise, she even helped me to escape. However, it wasn't that simple. I decided to make a call to my mom and make her stay on the phone and thankfully he didn't speak Spanish so I told her that she needed to tell me I needed to go home. He had me mute the phone and just wanted his name tattooed where the sun doesn't shine and instigated and went through my bag and I just wanted to leave. Making the three hour drive back home at night was a nightmare. If I didn't reply to him within seconds on three different apps he would go nuts. I couldn't handle it anymore and decided to tell my parents about the situation. We all came to the conclusion that I had to block him on everything and even change my phone number. My life felt so threatened that I couldn't even go to school and had to finish the semester online and got my school involved in my violent relationship. I'm just happy to be out of that situation and it made me more grateful to be alive and to love being with my family. For context, I'm a 4'11 girl with night blindness and this happened to me when I was 21. I am based in Singapore and whenever I think about this, it sends me into a spiral of depression because I could have done something, anything to avoid the harrowing account. I have low self-esteem and would never get attention from men as I was and still am a heavyset girl. On top of that, I was very naive and assumed the best of people. The cherry on top is that I'm a pushover on the count of not believing in myself. My dislike of myself stems from insecurities like my eye condition. I only learned how cruel the world could be to naive and downright idiots like me when this happened. And I also learned that red flags, stereotypes are there for a reason. And that reason is not for them to be ignored. I was tasked to run errands for my mom late in the night after work as she had leg pains and I was the only one able to do it. From my workplace, I had to take a train down to the east side of town and then go through a mall to get to a bus station. Then I would have to get on a specific bus to get to my desired location to pick up items from a shop. That day, my work extended till 8pm as I had extra things to finish up at the office. I took the train headed to the shop and walked across the cabins to find a seat. All was good until I left the train to get to the bus station. My first interaction with this stranger was when he tapped my shoulder. I spun around and was met with a guy dressed in all black with tattoo sleeves. With broken English he asked a seemingly innocent question. Sorry, I see you from the gym before? I was puzzled because, like I said, I'm a little hefty and I don't go to the gym, and I told him so and walked off. At this point he trailed behind me into the queue forming for the bus I needed to take. This made me feel a bit antsy as at the bus station there are literally about a hundred buses to take but coincidentally he was taking the same one as me. Whatever. The bus came and the line boarded. He kept close to me and started talking to me and at this point in my head I didn't want to be rude and ignore him. I mean, he might have just wanted to chat and get to know someone and who am I to judge? So I replied to his questions with basic answers. Where are you going? He asked. Then I answered to collect something. Where do you live? In the north area. And I kind of laughed. Do you have a boyfriend? The last question caught my attention and my anxiety started to grow. I decided then and there I was going to get off the wrong stop to see if he follows me. Of course, he did. I didn't know what to do. I checked my phone and it literally had no battery. Just my luck. I was stuck with this dude in the night and I'm actually night blind. Great. Long story short, I still had to go to the stop and this dude followed me. He only left me alone after he badgered me for my number and unfortunately I gave in. I admit I was very dumb and a bit flattered I suppose. He texted me and was actually quite sweet on text. I should have ended it right there but again, he hadn't done anything to hurt me, albeit a bit weird. He asked me out on a date and I accepted thinking that he does seem quite interested in me. We met up and this is where it got horrible. He led me out of the mall and we were supposedly having a dinner date at, as he had mentioned, he had made a reservation at a surprise restaurant. 
I don't like discussing my eye condition with strangers, so I kept that under wraps while walking the city streets at night. This was quite romantic, I thought, walking and talking, until I realized that we were nowhere near the mall anymore, and I couldn't hear the city buzz. I didn't know where we were. This was completely asinine to me. I got really scared as the streetlights were getting sparse. He started putting his hands on me and I inched away every time and I think this made him more aggressive, knowing that I was afraid. I couldn't run. What if I ran into a ditch and died? I couldn't call my parents. If they knew I went out with a boy, they would kill me. I was hyperventilating and he said the words, Okay, let's get to dinner reservations and I was relieved. The thought of a lighted area means that I could run. He ordered an Uber and refused to let me see the address. I just followed, thanking God that that part of the night was over. I relaxed in the car, hoping to get at least a free meal after being bloody cornered like that. We get out of the car. I couldn't see where we were, so he guided me into the building and into a lift. Before I knew it, I registered that we were in a hotel when we were at the door of a dinky room. My heart sank. I think the rest is quite obvious. I felt alone and pressured, and I was forced to do things I didn't want to do. It lasted for two hours and felt like an eternity, and I couldn't fight back. I should have. Even with the risk of being beaten up, I should have stood up for myself. I waited for him to leave and found my way in the dark night alone to a random bus stop, and I went home and cried. I blocked the number, me being a pushover, me being an empty shell when it comes to self-love led to this. If I loved myself enough, I would have protected myself from being alone at night with a stranger and trying to impress him. But this wasn't the end. I downloaded Telegram a year later and he harassed me there made fun of my body and how easy it was to control me and I blocked him again. Moral of the story, in my mind at least, love yourself, even with your weaknesses, because bad people can smell fear and weakness, and I'm still learning how to, today. To start this off, I'm a 29-year-old man and three times a year I head up to the Georgian mountains to camp, fish, and have a great time. But after last trip, I doubt I will ever go again. I had been super excited the week before I was about to head up to Georgia and when the day finally came, I could have died with happiness. I loaded up my dog buddy and all my gear and started the trip. About an hour into my trip, I saw a road that I had never been on before. I decided that would take an hour to look around and go back to the main road. I lost track of time and before I knew it, the sun was setting. I grabbed my gear and dog and we hiked about 10 minutes before finding a nice clearing in the forest. I set up camp and looked around my camp. I saw a small man-made trail leading into the dark trees and decided that me and the dog needed a walk. I grabbed my walking stick, his leash and a headlamp and we headed onto the trail. I knew something was wrong when I couldn't hear a single insect or animal. Me and the dog stopped at a little creek when I saw something terrifying. Two eyes reflecting from my headlamp. This thing was incredibly tall, six or seven feet, and the eyes were too big to be human. My dog is usually very protective of me, but instead of barking or doing something, he just whimpered and peed on my leg. I've never seen him act like this before. He's seen bears before and has scared mountain lions away, but he never peed like this. As he kept whimpering, I felt terrible, like this thing hated me and it could rip me to shreds if it wanted to. Then it made the scariest noise I'd ever heard. It almost sounded like a maniac, screaming and laughing at the same time, and me and my dog bolted back to our camp. At our camp, I could still hear the thing from a distance and needless to say, it sounded like it was staying there for good. So I packed up my camp as my dog stood watch, and we ran to my truck and got out of there. I went straight home, and truly, I didn't sleep that whole night. Later on, I did some research on the internet of what could have made that noise, and nothing came even close to it. I really don't know what that was, but 
there truly is something weird in the woods of Georgia. This is a true story. It's told from the first person perspective of my older half brother. It's a story that's been told over and over again within my family at holiday dinners. And he tells it like this. Back in 1990, my marriage was on the rocks. Living at home amongst nothing but unbearable strife between my wife and I forced me to temporarily move out and stay at my mom's for a while. Mom had only been living in the house for a little over a year. You, and when he says you, he was referring to me, were only about seven. It was a nice, low-crime neighborhood. I need silence and darkness to sleep, which is why every night I wear both a blindfold and earplugs. Because of how uncannily I know the layout of the house, I'm able to go to the bathroom without looking. I've woken up in the middle of the night having to pee discombobulated from my half-asleep stupor. Jake, shut up. I whispered to my dog, who usually slept at the foot of the bed. He'd been staring at my door, whimpering. He had an ear infection at the time, so this wasn't unusual. What was unusual, however, was the tenseness in his muscles. I got out of bed and opened my door and walked out into the hallway when I accidentally walked right into my mom. I quickly placed my hands on her arms and I said, Oh, Jesus, you scared me. I had my blindfold on and I couldn't see, so I just brushed past her and went to the bathroom. Then, I simply went back to bed, but I realized something as I laid staring at the ceiling. My room and hallway smelled of a strong, flowery perfume. Just mom's body wash. She must have taken a shower before bed. Nothing to be alarmed about. What happened in that upstairs hallway didn't hit me until the next day when I was in the kitchen eating breakfast. She'd come up the stairs from the basement doing laundry when we engaged in some menial chat about the weather and eventually my marriage. So, what are you two going to do? <sighs> I don't know, I sighed. I think we're both just getting sick and tired of the arguing. It's not resolving itself. And I don't know, maybe it's unfixable at this point. Hmm, she murmured. Well, maybe you should call her. Yeah, maybe. Let me wake up first. Oh, by the way, sorry for running into you last night. I thought I was going to knock you over. With a furrowed brow, Mom shot me a confused glance. Knock me over? What? I began falling inside. What? I ran right into you in the hallway. No, not me. You must have been dreaming. I slept all through the night. I told my mom to stay put where she was without telling her why. I ran upstairs to get my gun and searched the entire house. When I reached the basement, I noticed the door leading to the yard was wide open. I went back upstairs and told my mom and a look of concern washed over her face, rendering her speechless. I ran upstairs and when I got into her room, I noticed the drawers open in the nightstand next to her bed. Mom, I yelled out, come up here now. When she entered the room, I showed her that both of her drawers were wide open and empty. She shrieked and frantically began looking in all of her other drawers and cabinets saying aloud, oh no, 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 this ain't happening. What? I asked her. I had $1,500 in cash and a box of grandma's jewelry. We called the police. They searched the home and then took a report. The officer then brought up something I hadn't seen. You might want to go back downstairs and check the wall next to the door. Written on the wall in black marker next to the basement door were the words, Nice meeting you last night. To this day, I have no idea who was in that hallway that night, whether they were dangerous or if they had a weapon. The end. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, 
r slash let's read official and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.